church we're going to say a prayer now let's pray hands together dear lord god i just pray for a new day today thank you for blessing us each and every day i pray for peace and comfort for those who are sad and healing for those who are ill lord i pray for pastor peter and the leadership team as they keep the church going even though it's not open at this time. I pray a blessing on everyone who watches this service today, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe, for that lovely prayer to start our service with today. And it's a real good morning to you all. Hope you're feeling okay on another lovely Sunday morning. These weeks certainly fly by, don't they? Well, today's service, we have some good news to share. Oh, we love good news, don't we? We have to give a huge congratulations to Pastor Praveen, who has now become a proud father of another son called John. And Pastor Praveen and his wife, Sweetie, and baby John are all doing really well. So here's a little photograph now for you to enjoy. We love the babies, don't we? And another baby this week as well. We're delighted, we are thrilled and overjoyed that Georgia and Darren have given birth to a precious, precious son called Bodie. Bodie was 10 pounds, one ounce. Ouchie! <laughs> but mum and baby are doing okay and the family are all doing great too. So I'm sure you'd like to join us in praying and blessing over both of these families and we thank God for the safe arrival and we hope to be able to see you very soon and celebrate with you. That's nice to have something good to start the day with, isn't it? It sure is. And it's Lent. Did you decide to give anything up for Lent? Have you decided to do anything different? Feels like this year we've actually spent a lot of time giving things up, haven't we? Giving up family parties, giving up seeing people, not being able to do much. So maybe you're doing something different for this year. If you are signed up to get our emails or you're on our Facebook page, we've been putting a little daily Lent challenge on there. It's nothing too taxing. It's things like so far we've had, what is your favourite Bible story? Read it together. We've had go outdoors and enjoy God's nature and pray for a neighbour. You know, there's lots of things that we can do during the time of Lent and the rest of the year, of course, to really be a good friend, be a good encouragement to the people around us. And I hope through all the little snippets we get each day for Lent that some of you will get involved and let us know what you've been doing and how you've been getting on and perhaps send some photographs which will be really nice. I've enjoyed getting out there in nature and looking at the buzzards flying round. I mean Mr Moss did comment and say it wasn't very kind of me to call Michael a buzzard but uh, I didn't mean Michael, I meant an actual buzzard. <laughs> 
Got to have a bit of a laugh, haven't you? <laughs> you have. Oh. Coming up is Easter, of course, and I'm delighted to let you know that we are going to be able to provide all of the children in the area with an Easter egg, just like we did for Christmas with the Real Chocolate Company Advent calendars. For Easter, we're going to provide um, the Real Chocolate Company Easter egg, so they'll get an egg with a message of the real meaning of Easter, not Easter bunnies and things, but about Jesus dying and rising again. And that's so exciting, but I am calling on you for a bit of help because these eggs cost four pound each. You can't go Tesco and buy a real Easter egg, three for a pound. They cost four pound each. They are more expensive and we will be buying 800 of these eggs. So I'm asking and praying and hoping that you want to bless the children as much as we do. And I'm hoping you put your hand in your pocket and make a, bit, a donation towards this if you possibly can. And no times are tough, but, you know, times are hard for the church as well. And it's really important that if we want to be out doing things for the community, then we do need to put our hands in our pockets to be able to do that. So please, please, please prayerfully consider making a donation for, to the children so that we can go to the schools and give, because they will be open by Easter, but we can go to the schools, give all the children an Easter egg each with the real, real message of Easter and the hope that we have in Jesus. You know, it, it, there's a lot of doom and gloom about it, isn't there? This week, I unfortunately went to a funeral of my friend's son who was just 20 and who passed away. And that was very sad, but he didn't know Jesus. And without that hope that we have, when somebody passes away, it all seems lost, doesn't it? But let's get the message of Jesus and the hope that he brings. Let's get that out into the community. I know you want to do that too. So I would love it if you would help with this. And we are going to be giving them out at the uh, Nativity Trail. It's not a Nativity Trail. We'll be giving them out on the Easter Trail as well to the children taking part. So everyone in the community should be able to get some of the real Easter message. It's so important at this time that we can encourage friends who are going through a troubling time, isn't it? And I was speaking to Lorna this week as well, because it was Pastor Edwin's birthday. So she was obviously in mixed emotions about it. But she's so grateful for all the encouragement and the people who take time to speak to her or send her a message or just send her something funny to try and cheer her up. It's really, really important that we look out for our friends. And of course, this week, if you have uh, received our email or if you're on Facebook, you will see that one of our little fish friends, Ollie, has found out that he's got leukaemia. So that's been a bit of sad news for Ollie's mum, Debbie, and dad, Nick, and big brother, Jay. So they're in hospital at Birmingham at the moment, and Ollie has started chemo. The news they received was quite promising that the form of leukaemia Ollie has it's the one where 90% of children do survive. So we believe that the, through the power of prayer and the modern miracle of medicine, that Ollie is going to get better. And his mum and dad do have a Facebook, there's a Facebook group called Ollie's Fight. So you can sign up to that and get photographs and join in with some challenges and things, which are really helping to encourage the family, show them that they are loved and cared for. And they do have a Just Giving page as well, which they've raised around £4,000 on already. And that's really going to help them whilst mum and dad can't go to work and Ollie's in hospital. It's really going to help ease some of that financial pressure. But church, we do need to pray for him because we know that prayer works. We know that God is listening. We know that God is our healer. So we'll pray. We'll pray for a blessing for John and Bodie and we'll pray for Ollie and his family as well. Father God, I thank you that we can celebrate the new life for John and for Bodie and their families. It's an exciting time as they have this new child in their homes. We are mindful, of course, with Georgia and Darren, that they did lose Arthur. So there must be some sadness and joy as well at the same time. But we just pray that for both families, you will let them feel blessed and be able to enjoy their new sons. And Father God, for Ollie, we do pray 
for your peace to be with him and his family as he goes through this fight with leukemia. Father God, bring them comfort, bring them peace, bring them your strength, bring them your rest, Lord. Give them everything that they need to be able to get through this troubling time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that prayer for our new babies and for Ollie. We're going to have a time of worship now and we're going to focus on Jesus, of course. I watched um, a lovely film this week called I Still Believe. And if you have got Prime or Net Netflix, I think it might be on Netflix. If you can watch it, it's worth a watch. I Still Believe. It's the life story of Jeremy Camp. And it's happy and it's sad and it's about praying and miracles happening and then things going wrong even when you thought they were going right. It's a really roller coaster of emotions in the film. But through it all, no matter what happens, we still believe. We still believe in God's faithfulness, don't we? No matter whether we're on the hilltop or in the valley. We still believe that God's word is true. His word is holy. We still believe that even when things look dark and we can't see, we still believe in our God. We still believe that he is holding us. We still believe that he is helping us and guiding us. And he always will be. So we're going to have a time of worship now. We're going to listen to I Still Believe. So you might not know this one, but we're going to listen to I Still Believe and then have a worship time as well before Pastor Jim brings us this week's message. God bless you. Jesus, the light in the darkness. Jesus, the lamp to our feet. No mountain too steep, Jesus the land to our feet. Jesus the light in the darkness, Jesus the land to our feet. No chasm so vast, no mountain too steep, Jesus the land to our feet.
Hey guys, it's great to be sharing with you guys this morning. I kind of wish we'd be in the building and sharing together face to face again and not have another message from me on the camera. But you know what? It's We're in this situation, so we're going to keep plodding on, aren't we? And keep pushing through, as you know, I love talking about plodding. Um, but today I've got a, a real message on my heart. I really believe it's a message for, for us and for a season that we're in. Um, and lessons we can learn um, just from Jesus and conversations that he had. You know, recently my wife uh, has got me to watch Back to the Future. Now, I've never watched Back to the Future. and She couldn't believe it. She's like, Jim, how did you grow up in our generation and not watch Back to the Future? But I didn't. Um, and finally got around to watching it. And it got me thinking, I wonder if I could build a time machine. Where would I go back to? What situation would I try and change? Um, and then I talked to my daughter about this. And my oldest daughter was like, Dad, if I had a time machine, I would go back and I would go and find out who ate that bat and who started this coronavirus. And I'll tell them, no, don't do it because it's messed my life up, dad. I'm sure a lot of us sort of resonate with that. Josie, if I had a time to go back, I would um, go and get Robert Ledowinski um, onto a plane before the ash cloud. Those who don't know, best footballer in the world this year. He nearly signed for Blackburn Rovers. And the only reason he didn't sign for Blackburn Rovers is because the ash cloud hit many years ago, which meant his plane couldn't fly across to sign for us. So I've never forgotten that. That would be my time machine. Really superficial, I know. But if you know me, I'm quite superficial anyway. But it actually got me thinking a bit more than that, actually, is what conversations have changed my life? If you watch Back to the Future, you'll understand what I'm talking about with Marty and his parents. What conversations have changed my life? What conversations is consequences am I still living with now? You know, first situation, the conversation that comes to my mind was a conversation I had with a pretty young girl. Um, uh, in, I think it was the 3rd of April, uh, or 3rd of August, even 2002. Um, I had a chat with this girl. She said she liked me. I said I liked her. I really did like her. She was stunning. I was like, oh, she's brilliant. And long story short, 19 years later, I'm married to that girl um, with a couple of children. So it's amazing how that conversation completely changed my life. And then I think about a conversation I had with Pastor David Williams and Pastor Edwin Cotter. I was at church one night. They said, Jim, are you free tomorrow morning to meet us at Asda? I was like, Asda Cafe? You could take me somewhere nicer. But they said, no, we want to buy you breakfast. Let's go to Asda. It's like all you can eat, really cheap. So they took me to Asda Wall Stanton. Nothing like spoiling me. And they basically started this conversation. What, what is your future? Blah, 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 etc. A bit deeper than that. It led to me having a conversation with the elders and a few months later being appointed youth pastor. And in fact, at that time, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be an Elam or not. So that sort of cemented me as an Elam pastor, that conversation in Asda um, over a cheap breakfast. Um, as I say, they could take me somewhere nicer. But hey, I won't hold that against them. Um, and another conversation I had, I remember if, um, with my wife, we'd been married about three or four years. And she said, Jim, now's the time. I'm like, now's the time for what? She goes, do you think we're not ready to have kids? I'm like, oh sure what if I break them um but hey we had that conversation we said yes a few years later we've now got two beautiful girls another conversation I had with Chris Moss and an elder at Silverdale and with Ed Pastor Edwin Cotter about my future led me to talk about it where was God calling me what was God calling me to do led me to come to Burslem Elam Church and take over Burslem Elam Church and lead um yeah this part of exciting part of my journey so guys conversations they're powerful aren't they and I'm sure in your life, there's conversations you've had that you can pinpoint that are quite significant and quite major. For me, those are for work and for family. And those are probably the biggest conversations that I have. But I'm sure some of our conversations that we have, some of them have short term consequences. Some of them have long term consequences and some of them actually have eternal consequences. And Jesus had a conversation with a couple of men, um, Andrew and Simon. And these conversations that he had with these guys completely changed their world. And actually, it went beyond just uh, short term consequences. The, co the consequences from these conversations that he had with Simon Peter and Andrew were actually living with those consequences today and actually completely transformed history in many respects. And I just want to focus in to them. So if you're following in your Bible, um, we're going to look at John chapter one. We're going to skip across all four Gospels today, but I'm going to start in John chapter one. And I just want to get into why did the early disciples, why did they follow Jesus? 
because it wasn't just Jesus walking past them going, hey up guys, come follow me. And they were all saying, yeah, let's do it. Because these guys were dumbos. They were guys who had brains in them. They were guys who, through a series of conversations with Jesus, ended up giving up everything and following him. And sometimes, especially as Pentecostals, we can make following Jesus like this. Just put your hand up in a meeting and that's it. You're sorted. You're a Christian. Now let's follow him. Actually, I think the story that we can learn here from Simon Peter and from Andrew shows us that for most of us, in fact, I'd say nearly everybody, 99% of people, our journey with Jesus is gentle, gradual and a series of conversations. So if you're following today, let's find John chapter one. So this is what it says, John chapter one, starting at verse 35 to 42. It says, the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed him. Turning, um, turning around, Jesus saw them following them and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he said, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him. And it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and uh, heard what John had said and had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas which is translated as Peter. Now we can very quickly see here, it just doesn't take a genius to look at this and see one of those two disciples of John the Baptist. A disciple means follower, sort of someone you're learning from, you're sort of learning from another guy. Um, and this disciple, he was a disciple of John the Baptist first. And Andrew, John the Baptist pointed Andrew at Jesus and said, look, that is the Messiah. That is the Lamb of God. That is the guy who, who is the one you've been looking for, the one I've been speaking about, the one I've been preparing Look, he's the one. So it got Andrew on that on that journey of sort of following Jesus. And he decides that, you know what, I need to find out more. If John the Baptist is true here, the guy who I trust, a friend of mine, is telling the truth that I need to get to know Jesus. If Jesus really is God, he really is the Messiah, I need to get to know him. So what he does is he sort of loiters behind Jesus. And I sort of get this impression of like a film scene where someone's hiding behind a tree then sort of sticking his head up then running up next bit and hiding behind again then running forward and running a little bit more and hiding and sort of like is he spotted me I really want to get you know when you want to get close to someone but you don't sort of loitering around the edge and Andrew's doing this for Jesus and um, he's doing this and Jesus sort of turns around and goes what do you want now, I'm sure none of you have sort of loitered around anyone in the past. I know I, when I was younger, remember going to Blackburn Rover Stadium and I found out where the players were coming out and I was sort of like ready to pounce. I was sort of watching the players, watching for an opportunity when I can quickly pounce on them and get a photo. I think I scared Andy Cole half to death when I sort of jumped out as he's jumping in his car and went, Hello Andy, please, can I have your photo? He was like, whoa, okay. And I got this picture of a terrified Andy Cole standing next to me. But and, and for Jesus, he spotted Andrew sort of like ready to pounce sort of what he said, what do you want? And Andrew turned around and he said, um, I want to know where you're staying. You ever have those moments where you're rehearsing in your head? Like Andrew's been waiting for the Messiah to come. He thinks Jesus could be the Messiah. I'm sure he must be rehearsing all these questions in his head. And then the question, the words that come out as Martha, where are you staying? I'm like, no, are you the Messiah? Can you tell me the meaning of life? None of that. It was a, where are you staying? And I'm sure Jesus is like, okay, right. I wasn't quite expecting that question. But you, Jesus is great really compassionate. He sees the bigger picture. He sees Andrew's heart. And he says, Andrew, come on, I'll show you. I'll have a chat with you. This is where I'm saying, no, I'm going to have a chat with you, Andrew. So he goes and he has that conversation with Andrew. And he starts talking to Andrew and we don't know what actually happened because they spend the day talking. But I'm guessing it got beyond well, where are you staying tonight, Jesus? And actually went to a deep conversation. So much so that Andrew leaves that meeting, leaves that conversation with Jesus. He runs to his brother and he says, come on, I found the Messiah. I found the chosen one. I found the God who's come to earth. And Peter went and he followed and he went with him. 
to talk to Jesus. And guys, just the first bit of the story, some of you, you might be listening today and you might not be a Christian yet, but your friend has told you, check out this church's website. And that's why you're watching today. Guys, that's good. Because often our first journey towards discovering Jesus is a friend pointing us. And if you're a Christian watching today, you might be like having, you might have directed people towards Jesus. I want to say, keep pointing people towards Jesus. Because nearly everybody that I know who is a Christian, it all came from one person pointing them towards Jesus, helping them investigate Jesus, helping them know Jesus, saying, you know what, there's the one, there's the Messiah, there's God, there's the one who's different, there's the one who can help you. And I'm going to encourage you, keep pointing people towards Jesus. And if you're on this journey, keep journeying towards Jesus. If you're not quite a Christian yet, listen to what your mate said when your mate directed you to this website. But this encounter that Andrew had with Jesus was so powerful that he really wanted his brother to have an encounter. And we saw at the end of that passage in John where Jesus starts to speak to Peter, but it was a bit more than just, you will be called, or Simon Peter, it was Simon then, you'll be called Peter. There's a bit more happened before then, it sort of skips forward. And the little, there's a little conversation in between, which we can find in Luke. So flick across to Luke chapter 5, if you're following in your Bibles, Luke 5, um, and verses 1 to 11. And this is what happened with Simon Peter, another conversation that happened with Simon Peter and Jesus. One day, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and the people were crowding around him, listening to the word of God. He saw the water's edge, on the water's edge, two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into the boats, um, the one belonging to Simon, and, and said to him, um, put out a little bit to shore. He then sat down and taught the people um, from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put your nets out in the deep water um, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. I haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down my nets. And when they'd done so, they'd caught a large number of fish. The nets began to break. That They signaled to their partners in the other boat, come and help. And they came and helped. They both filled their boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats on the shore, left everything and followed him. You know what happens on the boat? Um, Boat here that Jesus sort of walks onto a boat. Now, the impression I got when I first read this, you just read Luke's Gospels, like Jesus just randomly stepping on someone's boat um, and this dramatic story happens. But actually, we see from John's Gospel that Simon Peter, he knows Jesus. He has a relationship with Jesus. That's why he says master in this passage. And he's Jesus is there sharing and preaching from the boat. And obviously, Simon Peter must be OK with that. Um, and then Jesus says to him, stick your net out a bit more. Now, In the back of Simon Peter's head, I'm sure he's thinking, Jesus, you're a carpenter and a teacher. Don't tell me how to fish. You know, but he he knows that Jesus is a rabbi. He's got to respect him. So he's like, you know what, Jesus, you're a teacher. I'm going to listen to you. And because you've told me to stick my nets out, I'm going to stick my nets out. Now, at this point, we don't know if Simon Peter really fully believes Jesus himself. Actually, because of the way he reacts at the end, I don't think he quite knows. But maybe he thinks Jesus might be the Messiah. He might be the chosen one. He might be God. So he says, okay, I'll stick my net out. And he sticks his net out. And as he sticks his net out in the deep water, even though he knows this is not going to work, but he's sort of trusting Jesus a little bit, he pulls out more fish than he's ever caught before. This is one of the biggest catches he's ever had. He's overwhelmed by the amount of fish. I could preach a sermon here, just go just on a tangent and preach about trusting Jesus. But the thing I love about this conversation between Simon Peter and Jesus is this. It's been a series of conversations that have obviously built up to this moment. And this moment in this conversation, Simon Peter has to choose. Is he going to trust Jesus or is he not going to trust Jesus? And Jesus is not asking him to trust him with his with everything quite yet. Jesus is asking him to trust him with something small just to start off with. And it shows me here that Jesus, those little conversations and our journey towards him, that often it's little trust things that happen, the little times we trust him that build us towards actually fully knowing who he is. 
And you know what? If you're looking for Jesus right now, maybe there's a few things you've discovered about Jesus. Maybe pray for someone who's sick. Trust him. Step out and trust him a little bit. Maybe trust him with your finances. Maybe trust him with your work situation and pray and hand stuff over to him and just say, you know what, God, I'm not fully sure, but I'm going to trust you just a little bit, Jesus. I'm going to put a little bit, a little bit of a net out, for want of a better phrase. And Jesus is really compassionate because I think he understands that sometimes people need to little, build a little bit of trust up before they can fully trust him. And guys, and if, if, you, if you are a non-Christian who's watching this today, you're not yet a Christian. Guys, I want to encourage you, trust Jesus a little bit. See what he can do. Put out a little net. See what the Bible says, what Jesus says you can trust him with and trust him. Hand over your family situation to him. Hand over these situations. Put a little trust in him because I believe he can come through for you. And if you are a Christian, stop trying to force people to make the big decision before they made the little decisions. Because sometimes people need to be on this journey and we need to accept and understand that everyone's on a different journey towards Jesus in a different way. And pray that your friends are your turn to tell about Jesus. Pray that they have opportunities to trust him just a little bit and encourage him just to trust Jesus a little bit. But Peter here, after he pulls in this um, big haul of fish, his reaction is really, really interesting. Now, I've met a few fishermen in my time, and Peter's a hard fisherman here. And fishermen are tough guys. Okay, normally big tattoos, big burly guys, or even little burly guys, but you wouldn't mess with them in the pub, okay, on a Saturday night. They're pretty tough guys. Um, I remember deep sea fishing a few years ago, and the one guy telling me uh, all about how it, uh, up in Iceland, how what would happen if they fell in the water, you just told to keep still, die as quick as possible, because you're going to die anyway. And he told us all these horror stories about people losing fingers and hands and all sorts of things. We were just like, oh! get us back to shore quickly this guy was a tough guy okay and this tough guy falls weeping before Jesus after this happens and he's like Lord I'm sinful I messed up you know there came that moment when he suddenly saw who Jesus was it was through a series of conversations and then that one moment of trust we trusted and Jesus came through for him it completely changed his life. This conversation completely changed. Peter suddenly saw Jesus for who he was. And Jesus' response is amazing. He says, don't be scared. When he, so Simon Peter suddenly realizes how human he is and how divine God is, how divine Jesus is, how amazing Jesus is, how powerful Jesus is, how incredible Jesus is. His first reaction is, get away from me, Jesus, because I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. And Jesus says, you are. He says, come follow me, come journey with me, and I'm going to take you further than you ever, you ever could imagine. Now, some of you guys know that feeling when you've trusted Jesus and Jesus has come through for you. And there's that moment of overwhelming sense of, wow. Some of you weren't even sure about him and you trusted him and it's like, oh, wow. You know, as a young Christian, I wasn't sure about Jesus. and Not a young Christian, as a young person, I was investigating Jesus. I wasn't sure if he was real or not. And I remember putting out a few nets, putting out a few questions and he kept answering them. And I was like, wow, moments continually until that moment where like Simon Peter, I bawled my eyes out because I realised how unworthy I was and how great Jesus was. And I had to make a decision that day. Am I going to follow him? And if you look at Matthew chapter four and Mark chapter one, Jesus then gives the question. He says this, will you come and follow me? Simon, Peter and Andrew, will you come and follow me? Will you come and follow me? Because a lot of people keep telling me about, about conversation. They find out I'm a pastor. They often say this when I have chats. They say, Jim, I'm always talking to Jesus, which is brilliant. Well, Jim, Jesus has helped me so much. And then I get often, like there's those Christians and non-Christians that come up to me. And when they find out I'm a pastor, like, can, I do not, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. I don't believe Jesus is real. I just believe he was a man, blah, blah, blah. But can I tell you something re really interesting that happened to me? I had a dream about Jesus. Can I tell you about this dream? And they start to tell me, or you know what? This supernatural thing happened to me. I can't explain it. I don't believe in God, but how do I explain this? And it comes that moment, guys, when you've got to actually make that decision of whether you're going to choose to follow Jesus or not. It's great having the experiences. It's great having those conversations with him. But there comes a moment when you have to decide, am I going to leave everything and follow Jesus? Am I going to turn my life around and follow him? Or am I just, I'm just going to keep going the same way? Because Jesus is not an optional extra. He calls us to give up everything and follow him. Now, it doesn't mean you have to sell your house or anything like that. So don't worry, don't panic. 
It means actually he makes make a complete turnaround in our life to follow him and live completely differently. You know, Pete and Andrew's conversations, it didn't stop just with that nice feeling and that feeling good and saying, oh, that's God. Jesus actually said to them in the end, will you come and follow me? And they left everything and followed him. And there comes a moment for each and every one of us where we have to face that question. Are you prepared to follow Jesus? I truly follow Jesus, not have him as an optional extra. So I just want to bring it to a close now, um, just this message. I'm just going to quickly summarise it very quick. I I think this these conversations with Jesus mirror beautifully most of our journeys towards him and most of our journey relationship to uh, coming into relationship with him. And there's just a couple of things. I just want to put four things I think we can just draw out of this very, very quickly. So I'm coming in an end. So hold on. Keep going with me. Keep sticking in. This is it. Number one, all of our journeys with Christ. It starts with someone or something pointing towards Jesus, pointing us in his direction. Now, maybe you could be that person who points someone to Jesus, um, or maybe you're being pointed towards Jesus. And that's why you're watching this message now. And I want to encourage you, keep going towards him. Keep pointing people towards Jesus. And if you're the one who hasn't yet found him, keep journeying towards him. Keep trying to find out more about him. I know Elam are doing an amazing thing soon with them, running Alpha courses all across the country. Um, I think it's in April. And there's a great chance just to explore Jesus. Find out more. That's the first thing. It always starts someone's journey with someone pointing or something pointing people towards Jesus. Okay, the next thing here, we have to pursue Jesus and find out more. You know, Andrew, he pursued Jesus. He followed Jesus. I said earlier, he loitered him, he loitered um, behind him, wanted to know more, was watching him, wanted to talk to him. And actually, to follow Jesus, we actually need to pursue him. We need to actively seek to do something. It's not a passive thing. You will not find out more about Jesus by sitting on your sofa going, come on, Jesus, download everything to my brain. doesn't quite work like that. You need to try and talk to him. You need to pray. You need to try and have those conversations with him. Read the Bible. Chat to a friend about Jesus. You do some YouTube searches about sermons about him. Do some research about him. Chat to a Christian friend who knows more about him. Find out more about him. That's the second thing. We have to pursue Jesus. The third thing is this. There will come a moment where we have to trust Jesus. Now, not necessarily the big moment of trusting Jesus, but there comes a moment where we've done our investigation of Jesus. And like Simon Peter, we have to say, you know what? I think I know better, but I'm going to put Jesus to the test. It might be handing over your finances to him and saying, God, that doesn't mean give all your money away, to clarify, but using biblical principles for your money. It might be using biblical principles for in your family. It might mean learning to forgive, like Jesus said. It might be a time you have to trust and step out and actually try something little like Peter did with casting out his nets. And the last thing is this. There will come a moment where you have to face this question. And this question will have eternal consequences for you. So it's really important. Listen up. We will have to decide, are we going to follow Jesus? Are we going to choose to accept that he came, that he is God, come to earth to die for our, to teach us, then to die for our sins, who came back to life to defeat death so that we could have eternal life? And we have to answer the question of this. Are you prepared to follow Jesus? Will you follow Jesus? How you answer those quest- these questions will define what will happen with your relationship with Jesus. What are you going to do next when someone's pointing you to Jesus? What are you going to do to find out more about him? How are you going to trust Jesus just a little bit, just to learn that you can trust him? And then finally, will you follow Jesus? You know, since I've made that decision, my life has turned around completely. God has done amazing things in my life. It's the best thing I've ever did was learning to trust him and learning to step out from him. If you are a Christian today, can I encourage you to use Jesus' example to gently take people towards him, to encourage them on this journey towards him? And if you aren't yet a Christian, what's your next step? If someone's pointing you towards Jesus today, what can you do next? What are your next steps? Where are you in that journey towards him? And why don't you take the next step, ask the next question, and ultimately, in the end, I believe, come to know God in human form, Jesus, as your friend 
as the one who loves you, as the one who wants to know the best, have the best for you. Thanks for listening. Um, if anything here has been encouraged, I encourage you to contact one of the pastors, um, just to have a chat with them, just to know more about him. And if you want to know more, say have a chat with some Christian friends if you don't know Jesus. And if you do know Jesus and you want to know about sharing him more, just have a chat with some other people. Have a chat with one of your pastors just to know about how you can share him better. But have a great day. Be blessed. And hopefully next time I see you, you won't be on camera. It'll be face to face. I live in optimism, don't I? But have a brilliant day. Thanks, Pastor Jim, for another inspiring message. It is so important to trust Jesus, isn't it? And you just don't know the conversations that you have with people, where it's going to lead them in the future. Who would have thought Pastor Jim speaking to Pastor Williams and Pastor Edwin would end up working at the church and then running his own church as well? It's amazing what God does in our lives, isn't it? Perhaps you can have a think about all the things God's done in your life this week. Perhaps you want to write them down. Or perhaps you would like to do a little video and share your testimony and share with us some of your journey with God. If you would like to, please do get in touch because we'd love to see your face on a video. We can't wait. So we're just going to finish today's service by singing, Christ is enough for me. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's what life's all about, isn't it? Following Jesus. And of course, after the service, remember we have our virtual cafe. I'd love to see you for a brew and a chat. And in the week, we have prayer meetings going on every day of the week. If you would like the Zoom login details, please do just let us know. Well, God bless you. Have a lovely rest of your day. Remember to keep trusting Jesus no matter what's going on in your life. God bless you.